Well, thank you, David, for that very generous welcome. And on behalf of everybody here, thank you, David, again, for the huge amount of work you've put into organising this session. I appreciate very much the invitation. And finally, it's a crisp night out there. Thank you to everybody in the room for putting on your coat and forsaking the television and your whiskey and coming to hear me. It's great to see you. Now, as you, some of you know, I live in Townsville. I'm at James Cook University, and that's in the tropics, North Queensland. And it will surprise you, therefore, that I actually own a coat, but I do. Now, I like to show you that, but now I'm going to take it off and get down to work. OK, well, you may think that this title up here is a bit in your face. Uh, the global warming fad. Well, it is indeed in your face, and I dis disclaim any ownership. My title is the one beneath it. So who said global warming is a fad? Well, it's this gentleman here. Former New Zealand Deputy Prime Minister, my, my, lower carbon dioxide emissions were a 2007 fad, he said. Now, he was Deputy Prime Minister of the Labour government that brought in the emissions trading scheme, or if you like, carbon dioxide charging scheme that New Zealand unfortunately has. And here he is, now he's no longer in government, saying, oh, well, we had to do it. It was just a fad, but we wouldn't have been elected. We wouldn't have got the votes unless we did this. Don't, don't, don't you worry your head about that. It's, it's a fad. Well, that's quite interesting. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if we get uh, our tax uh, put on to us, whether Julia Gillard in a couple of years' time looks back and says, oh, well, that was a fad at the time. Just pay up your tax now, folks. My title is this one, Climate Context as a Better Basis for Policy. And David's already referred to, and the first or next slide uh, provides that context from an ocean drilling program core. So I will, to begin with, provide you with context about temperature, because this is a discussion about average global temperature, and context about carbon dioxide. But that will only be a few slides, though it'll take a while to get through them. Then I will say, well, we're at a rather strange place at the moment. How on earth did we get here? And I will just show you a couple of slides that will help explain how we got to where we're at today. And then there's nothing worse than going to a talk which is entirely negative, a whinger from North Queensland. So the last part of the talk will be constructive. It will say, hey, where should we go from here? And one option, of course, is we should have this carbon dioxide tax but I'm going to suggest to you there's a superior policy and that'll be the last part of the talk. So let's get going. Context. Now, you commonly hear it said, you even read it in the Brisbane Courier Mail, that uh, it's unusually warm at the end of the 20th century. That's what all this is about, this global warming stuff. So that's what the scientists would call a hypothesis. To you and me, it's an idea, but scientists like to have this mysterious lingo they can use so you feel you don't understand them. So it's just an idea, really. So the idea is temperature at the end of the 20th century was unusually warm. And that is a testable idea. And as Dave has already said, that's what scientists do. They don't play with computers. Computers are just tools. What scientists do is they use what's between their ears to test ideas about the world around them. And they call those ideas hypotheses. So the hypothesis is temperature at the end of the 20th century was unusually warm. Here's the reality check. Six million years of Earth history. Imagine how many election campaigns you could run in that time. OK, and this curve is the temperature of the central Pacific Ocean. And the scale, sorry, the arrows got lost. The arrow should be between here and here, is equivalent to about a 10 degree temperature change in middle latitudes. And this comes from one of the cores that David read that quotation out. Uh, and we make the measurements on the core. Well, we're over here, not uh, years ago today, and today's temperature is where the curve has just come up to that point, and the black line across the diagram is today's temperature extrapolated back in time. Now, what was the thing we wanted to test? That today's temperature, the black line, is unusually warm. Well, hang on a moment. What about the left-hand side of that line? What's temperature doing between six and three million years? Goodness, that can't be right. It's on this scale, two to three degrees warmer than today. Oh, they've never told us that before, have they? Yeah. Furthermore, it's doing something else. It's jigging up and down the whole time. It's like a teenage boy, it can't keep still. It's always either warming or it's cooling. This is a second great myth of the public debate at the moment, that climate is a stable thing 
And before the Industrial Revolution, it was just jogging along nicely. And then we came along, and this gentleman bought his second SUV, and it went up like that. That's a myth. Climate is always changing. Change is what climate does. Indeed, the phrase climate change, and all the young ladies in the middle will know this from their English teacher, is a tautology. What does that mean? It means it says the same thing twice. You do not need climate change. It's just climate. Yeah, we all know climate change. So, this is a very revealing context, isn't it? Oh, so climate always changes. Oh, so here, we're actually a bit cooler than we were, by two to three degrees back there. When did most of the plants and animals on the earth we have around us today evolve? How long have they been around, most of them? And the answer is most of them have been around for a lot more than six million years. So they're genetically pre-adapted, in fact, to temperatures that are two to three degrees warmer than today's. That's amazing. We're led to believe there's going to be a biodiversity crisis if the temperature goes up a degree or two. Nobody can believe that who knows anything about the history of life on this planet. Okay, now we see here about three and a half million years ago, the temperature takes a dive and it declines into what we call ice house earth. And as it does that, the little fluctuations in temperature get bigger and bigger and bigger until for this last million years, we have these huge glacial interglacial cycles. The last glaciation is so close to the right-hand axis that you can scarcely see it. How long ago was that? Does anybody know? It was obviously not very long ago. It was just 20,000 years ago. Now, that's a big ice cap. Antarctica gets bigger, and Eurasia has this big ice cap. Where does the water come from? Oh, well, it comes, it comes out of the sky. It's snow. Well, how did it get up there? Oh, it's evaporated from the ocean, of course. How silly. So what happens if we evaporate enough water out of the ocean to build two big ice caps? The sea level goes down, doesn't it? That's amazing. So if you were to stand on the end of the harbour, at the end of the, the um, docks in, in Brisbane, and look out to sea 20,000 years ago, to the sea today, what would you see? You'd see an arid coastal plain. And you'd see Aboriginals running around on it, trapping... Uh, hunting kangaroos. And if you actually went out over the horizon, about 60 kilometres in the seaward direction, you'd come to the shoreline just 20,000 years ago. And along there, the Aboriginals were setting fish traps. And of course, down in the southeast corner of Australia, they went for a bit of a walk and they thought, oh gee, we can keep going. Oh look, here's Tasmania. And similarly, they walked across Torres Strait. These are real, real climate and environmental changes. You better believe it. They are within the cultural history of our native Australians. That's real climate change. Now, <clears throat> there's an American writer and, and uh, humorist, Mark Twain, who was asked what was the difference between climate and weather. Oh, he said, well, climate is what you expect, but weather is what you get. <laughs> if there's one thing scientists hate, it's smart like that. So a scientist isn't going to use that. A scientist is going to say we've got to have a number on the definition. So the meteorologists of the world back in the early 20th century said, yeah, we accept that climate is the average of weather, but how average? And somebody said, oh, what about 30 years? So, oh, good idea. So now it's been accepted ever since that a climate data point is the average of 30 years of weather records. So we go out to, down to the Toowoomba Railway Station or wherever you've got your local weather station and we get an, an average annual temperature each year for 30 years and it's up and down a bit as it goes. You now average all those and one climate data point for 30 years. And that's not my North Queensland definition, that's the accepted international definition of the difference between climate and weather. So this curve, being six million years long, divided by 30, is 200,000 climate data points. Is that all right? So I study this sort of information. Do I have a right to say something about climate change? You think, yeah, I might know something about climate change? Yeah. So why is it I'm called a climate denier and told that I'm not a real climate scientist? It's only the meteorologists, I believe and the computer models that are allowed to be real climate scientists. Well, that's an interesting thought. Let's examine that thought with the next slide. This is the only accurate temperature record we have made with instruments of global temperature. 
I need to make it quite plain. The previous slide was not global temperature. It was the average temperature of the central Pacific Ocean. So I cherry-picked that specially to get the pattern that I wanted to convince you of. Absolutely untrue. There are scores of other examples I could have chosen from different places in the world that show a similar pattern. But it's just a matter of scientific fact. You cannot actually measure a global temperature six million years ago. You can, however, measure and average a global temperature today because we have satellites and they're going around in geostationary orbit. The Earth spins beneath them and they measure several times a day the temperature through the atmospheric column of air beneath the satellite. So that's where this curve comes from. It starts in 1979 because that's when we put up the first weather satellites and it finishes in 2011 because that's where we are today. So that's just over 30 years. How many climate data points is that? One. Goodness gracious me. So this is a weather record. It's not a climate record at all. And the people that want to revolutionise the world energy economy that want you to pay a tax that's going to cost the average family of four more than $2,000 a year extra from next year if it comes in. These people want to do all of this on the basis of a scientific record, which is one climate data point long. Well, what does this record say? The blue is the noisy annual, or monthly I should say, uh, determinations, and the red is the running average you should look at. And we see, we've got this idea, haven't we, that not only was global temperature unusually warm at the end of the 20th century, well it wasn't, but that's the idea, but also that warming took place at a, at a very fast rate. So the question, second hypothesis we might test, or third one is, did global warming happen uh, at the end of the 20th century? And we look at this graph and we say, well, uh, the temperature in March is actually below the long-term average of zero, it's negative one. But in January this year, the temperature was right on the long-term average. Well, that's the same as it was in 1996, and it's the same as it was in 1980. So has the temperature got warmer? There's 30 years of record. Temperature hasn't got warmer at all, has it? Oh, you want to watch out for this guy. He's from the tropics. He'll pull the wool over your eyes. He's not only cherry-picking, he's got the effrontery to make the points red so you understand that they're cherry-picking. If he was a real scientist, he'd fit a curve through the data. Or a line. Oh, would I? Okay, well, let's do that. There you are, Bob. We told you so. There's global warming. And furthermore, Carbon dioxide's gone up from 335 parts per million here to 3, that's a 15% increase. We told you carbon dioxide was causing warming. Is that so? Now anybody in the room that has any experience of looking at graphs and fitting lines through them understands that not only the slope in terms of angle of the line, but the actual direction of the line, whether it's going up or down, is totally controlled by the choice of the end point. And if you just say, well, we've only got 30 years of record, let's presume that's enough, one climate data point, let's assume that's enough, then, and you fit a line between the beginning and the end, then indeed you do get a gentle warming over those years. But that's an interpretation of the data. There's a third interpretation again, which is you see this big spike in here, that's in 1998, and I can't ask you what it is because it's written up here and you can all see. It's the El Nino warming. It's one of the largest El Ninos of the 20th century. And El Ninos are not only warm in Australia, but they produce a warm global temperature. And another interpretation of this data, I'll go take that line off, is that it's jogging along up and down doing its thing. No change there and no change here, but a step of about 0.2 degrees occurs across the 1998 El Nino. Now, the World Weather System does that sometimes, and did it previously in 1979 in a step called the Great Pacific Climate Shift. What effectively happens is if you administer a big enough shock to the system, thermal shock, and that's what this uh, El Nino was, then when it settles down again afterwards, it settles down in a slightly changed state. So that's a third interpretation. Now, have the facts changed? No, these are the best facts we've got. No, no scientist doubts that is the best temperature curve we've got. So what's changed between the step in, sorry, the three points, no change, the step, yes, a change, but a step change, which is not consistent 
with a slow trend driven by this gentleman now buying a third SUV. And then the third possibility, which is we put the line through it and there's your global warming bob. Why is it that you have never in the Australian ever seen or heard discussed two of those alternatives? When did the ABC ever show a graph? Well, when did they ever show a graph of any sort at all, actually? But, uh, and then use any other interpretation than this one. But why is that? Because there's no scientific reason for choosing between those three interpretations. They're all equally plausible scientifically. And one of them, this one, is consistent with the hypothesis that we're putting. That is consistent with carbon dioxide emissions causing warming. Well, that's fine, so let's go on a bit. Let's now look at the next most accurate temperature record we have. And this one goes back to 1958, and the particular paper that it's out of was in 2002, so it stops in 2002. Here's the 1998 El Nino. We can recognise these up and down bumps, and from the satellite record, we know it goes on out to about here. So from 1958 to 2002 is about 50 years, and this was collected from radiosondes. And radiosondes are these little instrument packages mounted below helium balloons that are let off all around the world, a network of several hundred weather stations every day, lets one of these off, it ascends through the atmosphere and it measures very accurately the temperature, the wind speed, the humidity and so on, back to the receiving station. Very accurate and a worldwide network. And look at what happens. Well, what happens is that we've replicated the satellite record. I mean, that's fantastic if you're a scientist. Here you've got two different bits of gear one mounted on satellites, the other on weather balloons, totally different technology, two different groups of scientists. They can't be colluding, and they come up with the same pattern. And at that point, you start to believe it. As a scientist, you never believe it until you've got to that point. If you've only got one record, you're always sceptical. OK, so, and furthermore, we see there is a slight warming over this 30 years. So all of that's consistent with what we've seen before, but... But what? But we've got another 30 years to look at yet. And if we look between 1958, goodness gracious me, whoever would have thought that. It actually cooled. And it cooled by the same amount that it warmed after 1979. So now I'm back to cherry picking. Here's my first cherry, 1958, 1979, 2002, and we know also 2011, no change in temperature. Hands up. Oh, and over this period of time, carbon dioxide's gone up from 315 to, eight, to 373 here, and by 2011, it's gone up more than 20%. So carbon dioxide's gone up more than 20%, and the global temperature hasn't changed. How many people in the room, hands up, are under 52? Come on, all you girls, hands up. Yeah, yeah. There's been no global warming in your lifetime. That is truly staggering when you consider what you are surrounded by in the political sphere and the, what the media are telling you. Okay, now, <clears throat> about 240 years ago, uh, a ship sailed into Botany Bay and it had a Yorkshire captain and it had a scientist called Joseph Banks. And as they do when they get to a strange place, the next morning they had their bacon and eggs for breakfast, jumped in the boat and went for a bit of a row on Botany Bay. And of course, Banks being the scientist had to be doing the rowing, so he's rowing along and Captain Cook's sitting there. And Cook looks over his shoulder and he says, hey, hey, Joey says, look, 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 there's a swan. And Joey says, well, what about it? I've seen lots of swans. No, says Captain Cook, it's a black swan. Well, that's really interesting because they were as sure as any two men could be that all swans are white. That was their hypothesis. They sailed into that harbour knowing all swans were white. How many black swans did they have to see to disprove the hypothesis? And the answer, of course, one observed swan. The record I've just shown you of the radio swans is the black swan. The record we saw before just half of that, of the warming on the satellite record, is the white swan. It doesn't matter how many white swans you've seen, you cannot prove a scientific hypothesis. There is no such thing as proof in science in that sense. 
You can only erect your hypothesis and test it. And the more often you test it successfully, the greater belief you have in the hypothesis. But along comes one black swan, and if you're a scientist, you start again. Real scientists test hypotheses against facts, not against computer models. OK, that's context for temperature, average global temperature. Now, I've only got time to show you one slide for context about carbon dioxide. I showed you before a graph which had 6 million years across the bottom. This has got 500 million years, and I'm starting to relax. This is real geological stuff. OK, and what's plotted is the content of carbon dioxide in parts per million in the atmosphere through this 500 million years of Earth history. Why this 500 million years? Given that the age of the Earth is a bit over 4,500 million years, so it's outside the lecture theatre over here is where the Earth began. So it's only the last part of Earth history, but it's a very important part of Earth history because this CM, 500 million years and a bit more ago, stands for Cambrian. And that's the period of time, John, just give it that name, that the first metazoan animals with shells, little shellfish, little crabby-like things, were running around the ocean. And so far as we can tell, to all intents and purposes, the oceans had a similar chemistry to today. If they didn't have, then they wouldn't have been able to secrete those shells. And we're about the same temperature as today. So we've, this is the record of multicellular organized life, fossils, through that time. Now, we look at the, uh, why is this graph so messy? Because there's all sorts of different ways of calculating. You can't measure directly carbon dioxide in the past. It's a difficult thing to do. There are different research groups that do it, and they get slightly different answers, but underlying the results is a clear trend, and that trend is one of decreasing carbon dioxide through time. So here we are today, and the carbon dioxide atmosphere today, before the Industrial Revolution, was 280 parts per million. So not 1,000, it's just a quarter of the way up that little bit in there. And back here in the Cambrian, carbon dioxide was, goodness gracious me, it was between four and 5,000 parts per million. On this scale is the number of times that number. So this is 5, 10, 15 times today's carbon dioxide. Well, it can't be right. The oceans would have boiled away. Surely, Bob, you know that. Dangerous global warming, carbon dioxide, it'll literally boil the oceans. Well, it didn't. Where did all this carbon dioxide come from? It's very high levels of carbon dioxide. Where did it come from in the first place? It's what's called juvenile carbon dioxide. And it comes out of volcanoes. And the early part of Earth history, back over here, was very volcanic, and there was nothing to take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it built up to this level. Now, only a guy from North Queensland could fit a line like that through that curve. Let's be more realistic. That looks a bit better, doesn't it? And that highlights immediately what we need to do next, which is there's clearly something's happened here that has drawn down that level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to about 1,000 parts per million. It happened during a period of time called D4 Devonian. Does anybody know what happened during the Devonian that made a machine for taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and burying it underground? Some of you do. It's the evolution of land plants. And of course, a lot of that, when the coal swamp accumulates, gets locked up in the coal seams, which are nature's bounty for us today. That's where we get our cheap energy from. OK, so, and then it jogs along a bit after that, and there's reasons for the ups and downs. But basically, sitting out over here, and after the, it, it, um, it's 280 parts per million when we start. It's 390 parts today after the Industrial Revolution, and you keep on hearing that we mustn't double carbon dioxide. Well, what, where does that number come from? Why double? I mean, why not we mustn't one and a half times, or we mustn't triple carbon? It's a complete number out of the air. There is absolutely no scientific reason for choosing a doubling. It's just the lingo that has arisen for discussing this issue, doubling carbon dioxide. Well, who cares about doubling when it was 15 times as much back there with no untoward effect? on the environment of the planet. So it doesn't matter whether you take 280 parts per million, which is what it was before the Industrial Revolution, 390 parts per million, which is what it is now, 
or 560 parts per million, which is double to 80. Any of those three levels indicates carbon dioxide starvation compared with the geological past. We live in a carbon dioxide starved world. And when we run our power stations and burn the coal, we return the carbon dioxide to where it came from and where it should be in the atmosphere. You don't believe me? When did the plants around us evolve? I said at least six million years ago and before. So the plants around us are also pre-adapted to higher levels of carbon dioxide than we have today, and also to higher temperatures. So that explains why the tomato growers out here just near Toowoomba put 1,000 parts per million of carbon dioxide into their greenhouses. And the Prime Minister calls that pollution. Mm -hmm. That's why the tomatoes grow better. And for Israel and Australia, arid agriculture countries, there's something else. The plants use water more efficiently. Carbon dioxide is an environmental benefit. OK. Now, you've all heard about the computer models because the government takes its advice from the United Nations and from a branch of the United Nations called the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the IPCC. And that uh, international organization has a number of laboratories around the world. One of them is CSIRO's laboratory in Melbourne that runs very complex and very clever computer models that project what the future temperature will be. And the only, it's not actually evidence, but they call it evidence, the only argument, if you like, in favour of there might be dangerous warming is the outputs of these computer models. But there are only one sort of computer model. I'm going to show you that second. First, I'm going to show you another sort of computer model, which is called a statistical model. And it's, it's, whereas the, the um, ones that CSIRO and the IPCC use are basically a black box into which you put mathematical equations that describe, so far as you understand it, the physics of the climate system. And that includes both the ocean and the atmosphere. And I'm not knocking them. They're very clever models. But basically, it's a box inside which you've got mathematical equations. You start it off with a given set of numbers, and out the end pops 100 years after you cycle 100 years in the computer, the temperature in 100 years' time. There's a different way to do it, and the different way to do it doesn't do it from first principles like that. It says, let's have a look at what nature did. And here's what nature did in the Arctic Ocean. This is the record from 1900 to 2000. It's up and down, it's up and down, but it's clearly got a pattern to it, a multi-decadal 60-year pattern. And we've, this is a fitted curve, a mathematical curve, that is fitted through that climate data. This is done by one of the USSR's, or I should say Russia's, uh, leading climate research stations in St. Petersburg today. OK, so this goes to the year 2000. We can now project this pattern, this curve, into the future. And that's the red line here. And when you do that, you see that this curve is predicting cooling through to 2030. So this is a perfectly good computer model. And I can show you others using different data sets that say we are likely now to have two to three decades of cooling, not warming. Um, furthermore, they first ran this model somewhere in here uh, before they knew that bit of the temperature curve. So this model, to some degree, has been tested. It projected, it said, the temperature is going to go down over the turn of the century, and the temperature has. Now, that's a white swan. That doesn't mean that the prediction is right, but it does mean we have tested this model once, and it's passed the test. So now let's go and look at the IPCC's models. And <clears throat> this is a curve I'm not showing you in other guys. This black blobby curve in here is the temperature record with thermometers in the little white slatted boxes and all the weather stations and averaged around the world between 1900 and 2000. It warms up to 1945 uh, or so. It declines down to 1979. And this is the rise in the late 20th century that we've seen on the satellite and the radio on records and that we're supposed to stop the world and get off this is dangerous global warming about. OK, so that's measured. 
And, and it's squashed down in scale because we have to have room up here to show this. This mauve, purple or grey uh, field here is the projections of 23 different models. Each one would be a line in here project projecting a particular temperature and they range between just over 2 degrees and just over 4 degrees for uh, increases in carbon dioxide through to 2100. So that's the projections of the uh, IPCC. And for the first 10 years, the red line is the average of these projections. And they say that's the most likely path, the average of those projections. Let you think about that for a moment. 23 models, they give 23 different answers in 2100. So at best, one of them might be right. Certainly 22 are wrong, and it's quite possible 23 are wrong. So now we're going to say, we'll take the average of all the wrong numbers, and that's most likely to be the right answer. That would be a great thing to discuss in a maths class next week. OK, well, that's what they do. Now, here's the rub. <clears throat> this little line down here is the trend between 2000 and 2008 that we've actually measured with the satellites and with the uh, weather balloons, and it's cooling. And it's, these dotted lines are the error bars on that cooling, and you see the IPCC is outside the error bar. So we know the IPCC models are wrong. This is not my opinion. We know that. They've been tested. There's a black swan there. They're wrong. So what is the basis for the government introducing a carbon tax? It is totally predicated on the presumption that the models, the IPCC models, are right. OK, well, the people that write these models, the scientists, and scientists, like other professional people, always have to protect their back. So this is what you'll find inside a typical report by these people. This report relates to climate change scenarios based on computer. Well, we knew that. Why are you telling us that? Models involve. Oh, goodness gracious me, that's interesting. Models involve simplifications of the real processes that are not fully understood. Did you know that before? Well, accordingly, no responsibility will be accepted by SARO or the Queensland Government for the accuracy of forecasts or predictions inferred from this report or for any person's interpretations, deductions, conclusions or actions in reliance on this report. Well, dang me, would you buy a used car from these people? So, government policy is being set on the basis of known faulty computer models. You are surrounded by a society that harangues you every day, and as David has said, there has never been a greater propaganda blitz in any peacetime in Western nation I've seen that exceeds the one we've had in the last three days. How did we get to here? How did we get to here? Well, I have a whole one-hour lecture I can give you on that. I can only show you two slides as an example of the sorts of reasons we're where we're at today. And the first one is, what, how does this happen, what we are teaching our young people. Now this is a, an ABC website. You can see that it's been designed by graphic design consultants who know what they're doing and they're targeting here from the style of this five to ten year old children. And it's friendly and Professor Fink is greenhouse calculator, well that's all, let's have a look at that. How big a green, pardon? How big a greenhouse pig are you? Click on the question numbers across the top and select your, uh, with each answer, see how your carbon dioxide production compares to the average Aussie greenhouse pig. That's you lot. Oh, well, let's do that. Here we go. So here's the first screen. There's going to be 11 of them, and they're all a list, and this first screen's about transport. So do you bicycle and walk to work, or do you on a bus, or oh, naughty fellow, do you, are you a heavy user of a car? The average for the Australia is always indicated, and as you click, if you click down here, virtuous end of the scale, then your pig, which is this one in the middle, gets a little bit smaller. That's you, that's the average Aussie greenhouse pig, and here's the virtuous little green pig, and didn't the graphic design artist miss a trick there? Not pink, green. Okay, so you go through this and you make your choices, and this pig gets bigger or smaller accordingly, and then you, you, click, up, you click on the what? You click on the skull and crossbow and the screen explodes in a shower of blood and a seven-year-old child is told they will use their share of the planet's resources in 9.3 years. 
Hundreds of letters of complaint came from all over the world. One from Canada read, I don't know where to begin, except to say that when we see things like this, we should complain loudly and incessantly. The ABC has crossed the line beyond science, beyond decency, beyond rational thought. Another person wrote in and said, this is child abuse. And it is. So what did the ABC do? They left it up on their site. It ran on their site for something like two to three years. It was removed six to nine months ago. I don't know the exact date. I could show you examples of starting in preschool, going through kindergarten and into early primary schools, we've got here, into secondary school and into university of continual indoctrination and propagandization of young Australians. There is no member of Generation Y in Australia today who has received an education in environmental matters. They have all received a propagandization. That is problem number one. Here's problem number two. The Institute of Public Policy Research is a think tank in London. And in 2006, it produced a report, warm words. Well, that's all right. How are we telling the climate story and can we tell it better? Oh, that's a bit of, yeah, a, bit of a leading question, isn't it? You bet it is. Here's what it said. The task of climate change, who are climate change agencies? Well, that's the former greenhouse office, and now they're the Department of Climate Change annual budget of 330 million people, a great big new building in Canberra that costs something like 180 million, and 1,019 civil servants sitting there waiting for the introduction of a carbon tax because they've got nothing to do until that happens. 1,019. So that's the climate change agencies. The ta their task is not to persuade, oh, goodness gracious me, no, rational argument? How old-fashioned is that? Instead, we need to work in a more shrewd and contemporary way using subtle techniques of engagement. The facts, note it's in inverted commas, that's because to a postmodernist, there's no such thing as facts. A scientist, just that's his or her opinion. My opinion is just as good. There's no such thing as facts. That's why we put it in inverted commas. The facts need to be treated as being so taken for granted they need not be spoken. This is like the fact that you've all been told this week that global warming's still happening. How do you? The Prime Minister told you. Don't worry about the facts not true. I mean, the facts don't matter. This is all about communication and harvesting votes. It gets worse. Ultimately, positive climate behaviours. That's the problem with you lot. You need some positive climate behaviour, and I'm going to make sure you adopt it. Need to be approached in the same way as marketeers approach acts of buying and consuming. It amounts to treating climate-friendly activity as a brand that can be sold. This is, we believe, the root to mass behaviour change. What last historical figure used words like that? OK, well, who cares? It's a little tin pot think tank in London, and it's left wing to boot, so who would pay any attention to them? Well, the answer is Tony Blair and his spinmeister, Alistair Campbell. For the last seven years of Tony Blair's prime ministership, he followed that advice assiduously to the T. He not only followed it in the United Kingdom, but he encouraged other European nations to do it. And through the British Diplomatic Service and an organisation which is otherwise an admirable organisation called the British Council, he perpetrated this worldwide, especially through the old Commonwealth networks. Especially Australia, Canada and New Zealand were targeted. And there's been a lot of British diplomatic money gone into behind the scenes, never happens in public, convincing our government and the New Zealand government it's worked. Perhaps we're just a little bit more cagey, but perhaps not. We'll all know in another six months or so. So, and this is who's doing it today. Okay, so that's the second reason it happen it's happened, because there are a very large number of vested interests who wish to persuade the world that dangerous global warming is happening because taking action against carbon dioxide will, in one way or another, benefit them. It'll meet their aims, often philosophical or political, uh, as David's already alluded to. It's a sort of new uh, world pantheism. Well, there's a third reason how all this happened, and that's passing yellow trucks. I gather you have 5,000 of them a day going down the main street in Toowoomba, and I'm sympathetic. But I was following one the other day, and out the back fell a briefcase, and it you know, bounced. And I thought, oh, gee, I'm, 
I'm not, I was going to say I'm a poorly paid university lecturer, but I'm not anymore. I've retired, so I'm even more poorly paid. And you can't afford to look a gift horse in the, you know, suitcases. They're stuffed with $1,000 notes, man. So I stopped and I picked it up and I opened it up and there was a USB stick. And on the USB stick was a talk by the chief climate advisor to the Department of Climate Change called Professor Will Steffen. He is also... Um, <clears throat> The, on the Climate Commission, which Tim Flannery chairs. So this is the major advisor to the government. Now, I don't have time today to go through his talk, which was 18 slides, and show you some of the slides and how bad they are. All I can say is you can't read and it's in red, but this says, go to Quadrant online and you'll find a critique of this talk has been posted there. Uh, so all I can do is share with you Professor Stephan's final slide, and here it is. Oh, sorry, note the briefing was to the MPCCC in November last year. What's the MPCC? The Multi-Party Committee on Climate Change. These are the guys and gals that are arguing at the moment whether we're going to have $10 or $50 carbon dioxide tax. Now before they got to that, that's policy, they had to have a briefing as to the science. So who provided the briefing? Professor Stephan did. When did he do it? 10th of November last year. So this was the final scientific advice that went into a committee chaired by the Prime Minister that is currently still sitting and deliberating what policy they will introduce following on from that scientific advice. And here was Professor Stephan's last slide. Prime Minister, he said, this is the bottom line. Four points. The earth is warming with 100% certainty. What he should have said was, the earth is either warming or cooling with 100% certainty. <laughs> In no case, in neither case, dangerously. It depends entirely how long your piece of string is. And I can show you, you're going to see on a later graph, places where if you take the right time scale, the Earth is clearly cooling. If we look between 1979 and 1998, it clearly warmed. If we look between 2001 and now, it's cooled again. So it depends entirely on how long your piece of string is. Well, that's not a very good start, is it? So what does he say next? He says, human emissions of greenhouse gases are the main cause of the warming observed over the last half century, at least about 95% certainty. That is a re repetition of what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said in its latest 2007 report. Now, <clears throat> what he should have said is that no evidence exists that measurable late 20th century warming was caused by human carbon dioxide emissions, because there isn't any evidence that it is. The statement of 95% certainty, and interestingly, the IPCC says 90% certainty. And somehow in Australia, that's morphed into, ooh, 95%. But no justification or discussion of that. And as you'll see in a moment, the numbers anyway are meaningless. 95% certainty is, is fraudulent. Now, I'm a professional man. I do not get up in public and say something is fraudulent unless it is fraudulent. I will show you on the next slide why I say that. No statistical analyses exist that can justify such a wild Wild? Yes, wild assertion. And there's the Prime Minister sitting there. I'm briefing the Prime Minister. Or pr rather, Professor Stephan was. Okay. <clears throat> this is the instructions by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, guidance notes to the authors of the report from which the 90% certainty came from. And what they are told is, they're sitting around the table discussing and they decide amongst them that it's very likely, very likely in their view, that the warming we saw in the late 20th century was caused by um, human greenhouse emissions. Ah, chaps, somebody said to them, but politicians won't do anything. You can't, you can't just say very lightly or, or extremely lightly. They won't do anything. You've got to give them a number. And I'm not making this up. This is the paper that was then developed so that these are subjective opinions. They may be very expert people, and I'm not saying they're not sensible opinions, but they are the opinions of a group of people sitting around a table, and they are then presented as 99, 90, 66 of probability. Now, a statement that something is 66% probable in science has a definite quantitative meaning. It means you have tested that with repeated uh, uh, recurrent tests, and 66% of the time it's true. There is no such test for anything to do with the IPCC. This is deliberate fraud. It's meant to make you think that, oh, these guys are scientists, they know what they're doing, they wear white coats. If you knew nothing else 
about the IPCC, and its reports are yay thick, and they spend years and hundreds of thousands of man and woman hours of science time goes into them, but if you knew nothing else about them than this one fact, you wouldn't trust a single thing you read in them. If I had a brother or sister scientist that did this in a published paper in a field I knew about, I would never again read any of that scientist's papers. This is just scientific chicanery. So, <clears throat> so much for number two. Number three, despite considerable uncertainty about the specific consequences of climate change in the future, so we're not quite sure, but we do know the risks to society and environment are very large and they are growing as we gain more knowledge. Now, what they're thinking about here is the risks, of course, the polar bears dying out and less ice in the Arctic Ocean and more droughts in the Simpson Desert and so on and so forth. Okay, well, here's the reality. Here's the Brisbane flood <coughs> this year, um, and uh, here are the historic floods, and back here, uh, eight metres, two that were over eight metres, and this one was four metres. That's only about half the size. The flood we've just had in Brisbane is about half the size of two big floods we had in the last century, and you can be very sure that with only 150 years of record that those are not the two biggest floods that have come down that river. So any suggestion, you all read it in the papers, you all heard it on the ABC News, that the Brisbane floods were a result of global warming, is just total scientific lying, and it's going on the whole time. There is no evidence whatsoever that global warming had anything to do with those floods, Here's another example. You hear it said there's going to be more cyclones because it's got warmer. Now, in fact, the energetics of the system is such that if it gets warmer, you should actually have fewer cyclones on, in a theoretical sense. But they've turned that round in its head and it repeated the time of cyclone uh, Alpha. What was the one in um, uh, St. Louis? Still can't catch it. Trace. No, Trace. Katrina, thank you, Katrina. They, they said it about Cyclone Katrina, or Hurricane Katrina, that it was due to global warming. Well, it wasn't. Here's the test. This is lovely work from um, uh, uh, the Great Barrier Reef by a, a gentleman called John Knott at James Cook University, as it happens. This is a record of rainfall uh, measured on a stalactite in one of the caves up near Chiligo. It's beautiful work, this. Uh, and you can, by doing analyses through the growth rings of the stalactite, you can reconstruct a climate record and you can reconstruct the intensity of the rainfall events. And above that line, the rainfall event is equivalent to a severe of a category four or five cyclone, the really big ones. And what we see is between 1600 and 1800, this period in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But between 1800 and 2000, one, and it only just got over the line. This is the Little Ice Age. This is when it was about a degree cooler. So there's no question that more uh, or bigger cyclones do not go along with warming, whether it's of human origin or, or otherwise. It's the other way around. OK, so what he should have written here is, there's no evidence the risks of climate change and hazardous climate-related events are changing. It is certain that hazardous natural climate events and change will continue, irrespective of whether this gentleman now goes out and I hope he does and buys a fourth SUV. Now this is not the place to joke about this, but I'm going to return to that a little bit further on. And nowhere more than Toowoomba and the Lockyer Valley do you understand the real hazards of living in Australia today. It's not earthquakes, it's not volcanoes, it is climatic events. And we've just had one here. Oh, sorry. So, um, finally, the scientific basis and imperative for rapid and vigorous action to reduce is overwhelming. Decarbon... What on earth is decarbon? Another one of these trendy words. You understand that you've got to give your wedding ring away? You're not going to be allowed to keep that wedding ring. At the very least, we're going to tax it 100%. Decarbonisation of the economy by 2050 is required to be the two-degree guardrail. What on earth is that? You've heard it said, haven't you? Time and time again, every Western government since about 2005 has said, oh, we mustn't double carbon dioxide because if we do, the temperature will go over two degrees, and if it goes over two degrees, it's dangerous. Remember that slide of six million years ago? Dangerous. That's the way the planet was for three million years, not very long ago. So where did this... I'll tell you where it came from. It's the same business of numbers. Back in 2005, there was a meeting convened by the big NGOs, Greenpeace, World Wildlife Fund and so on, and the British Meteorological Office in Exeter in Britain. Interesting thing about Greenpeace, by the way, 
It's just lost a court case in New Zealand and has had its charitable status withdrawn. A court has adjudged that New Zealand Greenpeace is acting as a political lobby organisation and is not a charity. Really interesting. Uh, and they had this get-together, and they sat around the table and they said, listen, we keep on saying to the politicians that dangerous warming will happen if you don't do this, that or the other. And they say, well, what's dangerous? Give us a number. So they sit around the table and they talk about it. They say, oh, two degrees, says somebody. And so they all agreed, and I'm not making this up, they came out of that meeting, the press were waiting there, and of course through these networks they have worldwide, this happened around the world in a 24-hour ripple, out went the thing that we're talking now, not about global warming, but about climate change, and the climate change we want to avoid is two degrees of warming. That's dangerous. There's no scientific basis for that whatsoever. It is a politically adopted target. So what should have been written here is, no scientific justification exists for assuming a two degree warming, should it occur, and it might not, would be dangerous. The term guardrail is therefore inappropriate as our policies aimed at achieving it. What policy have we got aimed at? Oh, that carbon tax. Well, 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 which is really a carbon dioxide tax. Well, that's Professor Stephens. Here's the bottom line. Prime Minister. We don't have a more senior committee in this country than one chaired by the Prime Minister. That's the scientific advice they were given before they started setting policy. If it comes in at $25 a tonne, then by 2020, it will cost us $100 billion. These are not small sums of money. Before I move on to the positive policy solution, I need to share with you one more piece of science because I haven't talked to you about abrupt natural climate change. And when we look at the climate record, we see that is a very common thing that happens. This is perhaps the most important time scale of all to look at. Not six million years, though that's important as a framework, but 25,000 years, which is the period of time from the last great glaciation, here in, Gre in Antarctica in blue, and in Greenland in red, it's cold. But climate is always changing, so it's always jogging up and down a bit, but it's cold. And then, since 10,000 years ago, in what we call the Holocene, Blue in Antarctica and red in Greenland, it's been jogging along there, and it's warm. And in between, it warmed up here and it warmed up there, and we see something sort of funny happen there, didn't it? This thing labelled the YD. What's that all about? Well, what that's about is it's called the Younger Dryas period of time, because this little plant is called a Dryas, and it grows around the ends of advancing glaciers in boreal uh, cold climate environments and the pollen from this plant are blown on the wind and they settle out in the mud at the bottom of glacial lakes and it's from cores through that mud that we first discovered the existence of this, uh, this period. Though these cores are ice cores, they're not mud cores. So the Younger Dry Sands, a period of about 2,000 years and what happened is, and it's only in Greenland, that's another important point, it didn't happen in Antarctica or if it did it's very subtle, so if you're running the county council for Greenland and you have to worry about what might happen to climate in the future, you need to know, this needs to be on your radar, it's something that's happened in Greenland before, but if you're running the county council for Antarctica, it's not such an issue. You might want to know about it in the background, but it, it hasn't happened here and it's not a, a... Horses for courses. There's no such thing as global climate. It doesn't exist. It's an imaginary construct for the scientists to think about and play with. You don't live in a global... Nobody lives in a global climate. We all live in our local climate, and those local climates have risks, and it's the job of the government to assess those risks and have a policy for dealing with them when they eventuate. So that's a very important thing from this slide, that the climate doesn't do the same thing everywhere, and you need to prepare for the particular spot you're in. But back to the Younger Dryas, it's very clear that this warming here, from glacial level up to almost full interglacial, took place in a very short period of time. Similar, and then it, over about a thousand years, got cooler down back to the glacial level, and that's the Younger Dryas, and then it got warm very suddenly again. And the question is, Bob, what does very suddenly mean? And I'm not going to sit around the table and have a bunch of scientists and then give you some manufactured answer. I'm going to give you an answer that's been looked at from core work done by geochemists, paper published in 2008, and this change took place, believe it or not, in three years. 
went from almost a full glacial climate to almost a full interglacial climate. This one took six decades or 60 years. That's still very fast. No scientist on the planet knows why. The Younger Dryas, there's all sorts. I've personally done work on sediments of this age and I've got my own ideas, but nobody actually knows in a predictive sense what caused this climatic episode. Lots of interesting discussion about it, but nobody knows in detail. So, <clears throat> three years. You know that Bob Carter fellow? He goes around telling people that there's no difference between weather and climate. He confuses the hell out of all his audiences because he mixes up those concepts. Doesn't he know that weather is short-term stuff that change? And climate is these long trends over thousands of years. So is this a weather event or is it a climate event? Well, of course, it's both. Because the processes of weather and climate are the same. And it's only a statistical convenience that we say, let's take 30 years' worth of weather and call it a climate data point. That's just our mind overprinting a logical order on something. But the reality, nature doesn't recognise that. And the processes of climate change in nature range from microseconds or milliseconds, which is the length of time it takes an ice crystal to form in a cloud, through to tens of millions of years, which is the time it took Australia to drift away from Antarctica by continental drift, create a new ocean basin, and heat is transported much more in the ocean than in the atmosphere, and that affects the climate of the planet. So climate and weather processes are the same, and it, it's a meaningless question, is this a climate or a weather change? The reality is it's very fast and it's unpredictable. Before we leave this slide, I'm often asked by newspaper reporters, well, Bob, is, um, is global warming happening then? And I look at them and I say, it depends. You ever said that to a journalist? Oh, they just love you. <laughs> what sort of a coup I got here then, they think. It depends. It depends on how long the piece of string is. It depends where you take the start and the end point. So if you want some sort of a reasonable fix on climate, you need to look at a few thousand years. We see this is the Holocene warm period. The Bronze Age sits in here. And since the Bronze Age is when we have learned to domesticate uh, cattle and, and, and uh, other animals, and we've learned to crop plants, and we've learned to build cities. So our whole modern civilization has grown up in the last 10,000 years, basically, of warm period. The humans that lived back here, and they were living back here, including the Aboriginals, well, the Aboriginals were all right. Australia was still warm. But if you were living in Northern Europe on the edge of the ice cap, what do we call those men that lived in this period of time? Yeah, well, they are Neanderthals, but that's their, I mean, what's their vernacular everyday name is cavemen. Why on earth would that be? Because you were either in a cave or you were dead. Cold is environmentally dangerous for us and indeed for other organisms. Warm is good. And coming back to our warm period where we've developed our civilizations, is climate warming or cooling for the last 10,000 years in both Greenland and Antarctica? it has been cooling. So the answer to the newspaper reporter is, no, global warming is not happening at the moment, it's cooling. Oh, but she says, what about that bit at the end of the late, oh yes, well that's fine, that's here, here it is. There's the tick at the end of the late 20th century. Context, context. Not this graph, and not the graph I started with, six million years, has ever appeared in public discussion in Australia on the issue of dangerous global warming. It is impossible to have an educated opinion on this without understanding those two graphs. Okay, that's where the core came from in Greenland, that red spot. And this is the end of March 2004, sorry, the beginning of March. That's the end of winter in the Northern Hemisphere. The end of winter, the sea ice has its maximum extent. There it is running across the North Atlantic Ocean. So that's where the ice front was the end of winter 2004. Here's a reconstruction of where the ice front was, 12 degrees of latitude further south during a younger driest winter, which was 28 degrees cooler than today. Ice covers most of the North Atlantic Ocean, and if you look in here, there wasn't much shipping commerce coming out of the ports of Southampton and Rotterdam. You can grow sea ice in a year or two. It takes thousands of years, indeed tens of thousands of years, to grow an ice cap, but sea ice if you have a really cold winter, then you will grow sea ice. Perfectly feasible climate hazard that you will get not necessarily down to here, but sea ice advancing way down the North Atlantic beyond levels we've seen at in the previous three or 400 years. Yet not a single government that I know of 
in countries that surround the North Atlantic Ocean is considering this as a climate hazard. They are all running around like chooks without heads, worrying about speculative, hypothetical, dangerous global warming, totally ignoring the real climatic risk that their citizens are subjected to. You imagine what this would do to shipping across the North Atlantic. If that's where the ice front is, imagine the number of icebergs in here. Climate change, both warming and cooling and step events like the Younger Dryas, is a natural hazard on all timescales. Okay, well, across the Tasman, we have this country in New Zealand and uh, they're, they're sort of pretty competitive at netball. Uh, sometimes they win the odd football game too. And they have different natural hazards to us. And if you live in New Zealand, volcanic eruptions are a real hazard. They haven't had a big one in European settlement times, but they will get one. They have had big earthquakes. This is the city of Wellington. That line is the Wellington Fault. Parliament House sits there about 300 metres from the Wellington Fault. Nothing is more certain. The only surprising thing about the Christchurch earthquake was it happened in Christchurch. Nothing is more certain but that Wellington, just like Tokyo, Los Angeles, San Francisco, will one day be destroyed by a big earthquake. It's not if, it's when. And when it happens, it will cause tens of billions of dollars at least worth of damage. So these are real hazards. Now, if you live in New Zealand and you take the risks in terms of the risks of major costs, then right at the top is earthquake and volcanic eruption. Of course, they have floods and storms and bushfires just like us, but in terms of big costs, they're lower down the priority list. But we don't live in New Zealand, we live in Australia. Horses for courses. And the horse we've drawn is exactly the other way around. There's no chance of a volcanic eruption on the Australian mainland. We do get some moderate strength earthquakes, such as Newcastle, and I don't want to knock them in the sense that they are a hazard and we need to worry about them, but we do not get the great earthquakes that the Pacific Rim uh, nations get. Uh, whereas bushfires, floods, storm damage, landslides and tsunami, those are, are big natural hazards. They are unpredictable, they're unpreventable, and climate change and sea level rise is exactly the same. When did you last hear a politician say, Let's stop Rabaul from erupting next week. Let's stop that earthquake from happening. And you laugh. It's just totally absurd. Yet you've been reading your newspapers and listening to the ABC television for 10 years, and they've been saying they're going to stop climate change, and you haven't laughed. Why not? It's every bit as absurd. OK, New Zealand does this better than us. They have a natural hazard centre charged with these things, and of the nine hazards, of which of course two are earthquakes and volcanic activity, but five of the rest, droughts, flooding, landslides, snowfall and storms, are all climate related hazards. So this is called GeoNet, and it maintains a, a network of instruments all over the country and a website, and this is the earthquake one. So these are the earthquakes in New Zealand, North Island, over the rest of them. But if you have a big one, you can drill down and get all this information and civil defence advice and so on. And this agency advises the public through the website and also advises the government at the same time. So it's called GeoNet and it's the sensible way to go. But across here, there is not a tab yet that says long-term climate change. And that is where long-term climate change policy belongs, in a comprehensive natural hazard policy. You would give these guys that run New Zealand GeoNet $50 million a year extra to their budget to do this, they'd be over the moon and they'd do it for you well. Instead, New Zealand's introduced an emissions trading scheme that's going to cost them two to three billion dollars a year, for which there will be no return whatsoever, as you'll see in a moment. Okay, well, we've signed up to the IPCC and IPCC's got a plan, let's call it Plan A, Stop Global Warming. What's needed is a cost benefit, and well, what are these people doing? Well, they're obviously looking for something. What could they be? Well, they're, oh, I see, it's this, look, it's obvious. This graph is temperature between 2002 and 2008, and it's the satellite temperature and the um, thermometer temperature, and it's cooling. I said that earlier, it's cooled in the last 10 years. Well, that's gotta be wrong, hasn't it? We know it's wrong, global warming's happening, that can't be right. So they're looking for the right graph, and the fellow in the middle finds it, there it is, got it! That's the hockey stick graph, you've all heard about it, haven't you? 
It shows temperature, this is 800 years or so, and that's the 20th century. It shows temperature is jogging along, not doing much for 800 years, and then bingo, in the 20th century, and this guy bought his second SUV, and up it goes, right. And in, just in case you didn't get the message, we'll put a fire engine red bar above and below. Now, when I first saw that slide as a scientist, as a senior professional scientist, I wet myself. That was the intention. And it took me about three months to actually work out, talking to other scientists around the world, that this was statistical chicanery. But it's a very effective propaganda tool to use, and it was the centrepiece of the IPCC's third assessment report in 2001. You know that picture of Lord Kitchener in First World War recruiting in Britain with a hat on saying, Britain needs you, and that used to be the most famous propaganda poster of the 20th century. Well, those graphic art and design schools that are really up to date now use this one instead. That, it only squeaks in 1998, it was done, but that's now the most famous propaganda image of the 20th century. And it was really effective. It's still being used today, but it's scientifically worthless. Anyway, it's what he was looking for. He's um, the Director General of the IPCC. His name is Dr. Pachari, and here he is celebrating his Nobel Prize. That's what's in it for him. Uh, squillions of dollars and power and influence and Nobel Prize. Nice work if you can get it. So who are the other two? Well, we'll leave New Zealand out of it, but here's our lovely Prime Minister. And what she wants to do under this plan, Stop Global Warming, is introduce a tax, and if it's $25 per tonne, it'll be about $2,500 per family of four per year. Well, you say, that's a big sum of money. Ta new tax, two and a half thousand oh, but, but, but Hang on, let me think about this. I'm a professional person. I pay much more than tax than that. I'm quite happy about it. I mean, I get a school here. I get a hospital here. I, you know, I get a national park. Uh, I accept. I live in a society. It's my responsibility to pay taxes. That's my cost. And here I get these benefits. So I, that's fine. So, yes, Prime Minister, you want to charge me 2,000 pounds? That's fine. What's the benefit? Have you been under a stone, Bob, for the last 10 years? The benefit is we're going to stop global warming. Oh, are you, Prime Minister? How are you going to do that? Well, didn't you know, Bob, carbon dioxide's a greenhouse gas? Oh, so it is. I'd forgotten that, yeah. So if we emit a bit less, and if I tax you until the pipsqueak, you'll actually emit a bit less, then we won't emit as much carbon dioxide, and it won't get quite as warm. Gee, I never thought of that, Prime Minister. That's really clever. Yeah, that's true. So how much warmer won't it get in the future? Now, I have asked that question in front of a parliamentary committee in Wellington, in Canberra. I have posed it in every public talk I've given in the last four years, and I have asked every politician or government bureaucrat that deals with this that I've met in that time also. Not one of them will answer this question. You have never read it in an Australian newspaper, until about a month ago, Andrew Bolt asked it on his blog. This is hard. And that's when the number came out. Because the answer is, that's the cost. The benefit is a warming averted of 0 0.001 degrees next year, every year. No, no, by 2,100. So the deal is, you pay me $2,500 per year tax for your family next year through to the end of the century, and I'll guarantee that our computer models tell us that in 2100, it'll be one one thousandth of a degree, not quite as warm. Good deal? You ever met an Australian taxpayer think that's a good idea? Don't laugh and think it couldn't happen here. Here's what the EU's doing. They estimate that the cuts they're making will cool by six one hundredths, 0 0.06 degrees, by the end of the century. They are already spending towards that end 380, it makes your eyes water, $380 billion a year the EU is spending at the moment. When you accumulate that through to the end of the century, that's $34 trillion. It will have six one hundred. of you can't measure that with the thermometers that are used in the weather station. You might as well stand under the shower and tear up billion dollar notes and flush them down the sink. It will have no effect whatsoever on the climate in any way. Well, you might say, we haven't got this carbon tax yet, and I'm going to go out of this room tonight, and I'm going to ring up my gran, and I'm going to get her on the phone to Canberra, and she's going to tell them how it is, and we're not going to have this carbon tax. 
This room is going to rise up and stop it. Yeah, but it's too late because you're already paying. Here's what we're already paying. Mr. Combe, the minister, went to a conference in Cancun last December and he agreed Australia would contribute to this fast start finance scheme, which is a scheme for giving underdeveloped countries who won't accept any greenhouse limitations. Um, we're giving them money to help them modify their economy so they don't make as many emissions. They're not going to pay for it. We are. And you see the countries down here, United Kingdom, Switzerland, Sweden, and the usual culprits, Australia up here. Here's the sums of money they're giving, and Australia has pledged $599 million. Did you get a vote on that? Was, were you asked about that? No. Oh. Well, it gets worse, because Mr. Combe also signed another piece of paper that if we have a carbon dioxide tax, and if it's $25 a tonne, it'll raise about $14 billion, 10% of that, $140 million, will go to the United Nations. That's the levy we've agreed to pay. We've already signed up for it. And that adds up, 140 plus 599, that's the best part of three quarters of a billion dollars. We're already spending that. Nothing you can do to stop that. Well, you can actually, because if you defeat the carbon tax, you can knock that bit off. So there's a motivation for you. Go home, stop the carbon tax, and then we won't be giving this amount of money to the United Nations. OK. Let's make this really easy. All these scientists and their computer models and they bang on, but for goodness sake now, I'm the minister. So if you're a lady, you're Penny Wong, and if you're a gentleman, you're Mr. Combe. Okay, let's get these scientists in. Let's, I mean, 100 years away, well, that's too difficult. Let's ask a really easy question. 10 years from now, is it going to be colder than today, like the Little Ice Age in 2020, when the Thames at London Bridge had two metre thick ice flows, here are the figures for scale, and these wonderful paintings of Europe by Peter Bruegel, they are oh so picturesque, and in fact millions of people were dying of cold, of famine and of plague. It was a horrible place to be during the Little Ice Age. So is it going to be like that in 2020, or is it going to be like it was in the medieval period and the Roman period before that, warm periods, when they were growing grapes in the north of England and we had these bounteous harvests and you could romp in the hay with the peasant women? Well, I know what I'm voting for personally. So that's a pretty easy question, isn't it, says uh, Mr. Combe or Penny Wong. So here you are. What's the answer? So what is the answer? Well, the scientists, of course, have got their computer projections, haven't they? And I showed you the two. The scientists belong to the IPCC say it's going to get warmer. And the scientists who fit the curve through the statistics say it's going to get cooler. So I'm a good Aussie and I like to use uh, Australian technology. It costs CSIRO, I'm making this number up, but it's of the order of five to $10 million to run their computer lab each year. It's a very expensive exercise. Uh, I carry a piece of technology with me that costs a lot less, but is just as accurate, and it's called a two-up paddle. Now, this is a scientific experiment, so I'm not allowed to read the results, you understand? This is kosher stuff. So, heads, it's going to be warmer in 2020. Tails, it's going to be cooler in 2020. A head and a tail, it'll be about the same. What is it? Two tails. It's going to be cooler in 2020. Now, you think that's just a stunt. That is as statistically accurate as CSIRO's computer model. That is a result of chance, and that is what the computer models also produce. They have no proven skill. So the amazing thing is, no one knows. And if any scientist gets up in front of you and says they do know, then go to another talk. So we've spent all this money since 1988 and the formation of the IPCC. We've actually spent more than $100 billion looking for the global signal of human impact on climate, and we can't find it. And our computer models are wrong, and we can't even say 10 years out whether it's going to be warmer or cooler than today. That's where we're at. So no one knows. Well, that's the reality. I'm the minister. What do I do next? Well, a kindergarten child could work it out. Hmm? You've got to prepare for either. Well, a kindergarten child might be able to work it out, but the Prime Minister can't, nor could Mr Howard. So we have to prepare for either. Plan A, the IPCC, presumes warming. It hasn't worked, it won't work, and it can't work. 
It hasn't worked because we signed up to Kyoto. The total cost of that's not known. It's of the order of two to three trillion dollars. Did you look outside the window lately and did the climate change? Of course it didn't. In fact, everybody agreed, including the Greens, when Kyoto was signed, it would have no effect on the future climate that was measurable. The important thing was to show in principle we're good chaps and sign up, and thus was the hook inserted through the nose. And that is why the Greens are so upset that Copenhagen collapsed the intention to continue that Kyoto style. But there you go, we did that, it had no effect on climate, so it hasn't worked. It won't work because we've also done another experiment, which is the Scandinavian countries that tend to view themselves as goody two-shoes on environmental matters. They signed up for a 20 or $30 tax as soon as this was all talked about in the early 1990s. Norway has had a carbon dioxide tax of $20 plus since then. And by 2007, Norway's carbon dioxide emissions had gone up 15%. The reason is petrol and energy are inelastic commodities to an economist, which means you can increase the price quite a lot before anybody pays any attention. Professor Garnow knows this. He's advised the government, you start your tax at a low level, around $10, $20, because people will just whinge about the cost of living, but they'll still go on filling up, believe it or not, in this gentleman's case, three SUVs. It won't make any difference. And in order to stop him doing that and to sell one of his SUVs, you've got to wind that price up to $150 per tonne. And they intend to do that. So it won't work because Norway's tried it and you've got to increase the price far too much for it to be effective. And finally, it can't work for reasons I don't want to go into beyond saying it's the principles of physics and that as the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, the temperature does not go up linearly. It goes up in a curve like this called a logarithmic curve. And what it means is for every extra carbon dioxide uh, buck that you put in, you get less temperature increase, bang. It's the law of diminishing returns. So we can double the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now, and there'll be about a degree or so of warming, and we double it again, there'll be about a tenth of a degree of warming. It is not an issue. We don't have enough hydrocarbons on the planet to burn to actually more than double carbon dioxide. So plan A hasn't worked, it won't work, and it can't work, but somehow nobody's told Prime Minister Gillard. So how do we look from overseas? This is what we see from overseas. Here's plan A, stop global warming, let's have a carbon dioxide tax, and it's like this, charge the light brigade. Now, that was a totally futile thing to do. To ride horses into a valley with entrenched gun emplacements on the side is basically futile, but don't doubt the bravery of those men. Okay, and if you don't like that analogy, then you look like this. This is equally futile, but it's stupid. And it wasn't King Canute that was stupid, it was as usual, as a great king or prime minister, he's surrounded by courtiers. And courtiers are best described by an adjective called fawning. And they say, oh, you are such a great king that you could even stop the wind and the waves and the tides. Now, King Canute, I salute, he is my hero. He's the first British empirical scientist. He said, go on, he said, you take me down there and I'll show you. So they took him down there and they put him on the side of the sea and he said stop to the tide and of course the tide came right in over his trousers. <laughs> That's the way Australia looks from overseas. This is our so-called world leadership. So what should we do? Policy plan B is obvious. The greatest natural hazards of living in Australia are natural climate events and hazard, weather and climate related events, such as the ones you've just been subjected to and others of like cause that will occur in the future. And if we start talking about trends, then droughts are always trends. So some of these changes take place over several years or more. We need to prepare much better for them. Oh no, we don't. We've got very good emergency services. We're doing very well. Yes, will you tell that to the 170, relatives of the 170 people that died in the Victorian bushfire? We're not doing it very well at all. We should be doing it much better. And the money we are squandering at the moment, and it runs into billions, on hypothetical global warming should be directed instead to preparing for, and when, as you had last year or earlier this year, a, a great event hits a place like Toowoomba or the Lockyer Valley, the money is in the bank to do something about it then and there without running the economy into the dip you've just seen in today's newspaper. So. You can read all about it in my book, Climate the Counter Consensus. Chapter 11 in that book, which the whole book is written around, is this policy plan B. 
Regrettably, it's out of print and it won't be available again until the end of July, but if you order it off either Amazon or the book depository and it's on the sheet, uh, they will, you'll get one from them as soon as it's available, and it may be that before then there's a, an electronic edition available. I'm working on that. It's important when I speak in public, and I realise I haven't managed quite to do this tonight, that I don't make political comments. So what I present to you tonight is meant to be the science, but I want to finish with one political comment, and here it is. This is the mandate that we have in this country for carbon dioxide taxation. You all know this statement made in August, there will be no carbon, sick, she means carbon dioxide, tax under the government I lead. Well, here's the government that she leads, is the House of Representatives, there are 150 seats, all the red ones, all the blue ones and all the grey ones ran for election on the basis they would not support a carbon dioxide tax or an emissions trading scheme. 149 out of 150 people in the parliament. One, the green Adam Brandt from Melbourne, bless his heart, said, no, I will support that. So the new, brave new world version of democracy you now live in is you elect 149 people on one understanding and they're going to turn around and do exactly the opposite. <coughs> The questions that are asked in the public polls, this was about uh, May of four, a little while ago, uh, do you believe in, I mean this is like asking, do you believe in motherhood? And the problem is that none of the figures that are in, noised about public have any meaning because they're based on questions like this, of course I believe in climate change. So I say yes to that and I'm now counted as supporting the government's policy. So what's amazing is, do you believe in climate change, that there's actually 22% of Australians that apparently think the world's flat. You know, they don't believe in climate. Well, why is that? That's because those 22% are actually smarter than you and me. They understood the question that was being asked. You weren't being asked, do you believe in climate change? Coming back to what David said at the beginning, you were being asked, do you believe in dangerous global warming caused by human-caused carbon dioxide emissions? That's the question that people read into that. But there's hope down here, because this question was a better one. Uh, based on what you may know, are you personally in favour or against the federal government's current proposal to put a price on carbon? Look either side of you, and the two people on either side of you said no. Two out of every three Australians, three weeks ago, is not in favour of this carbon tax. And I know of other polls that suggest the real figure is four to one. 80% of the public is against it, and 20% of the public is for it. And that is a complete reversal of the figures of about two to three years ago when the great majority of the public were in favour of it. Thank you very much indeed.